Well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, welcome to this special presentation of the Alworth Institute, which is co-sponsored by the Climate Action Team of the Unitarian Universalist of Duluth. And I'd like to thank Sherry Bridges of that group for helping to arrange for this presentation here today. I'm Cindy Christian, director of the Alworth Institute. We're finalizing our program for fall 2023. I almost said 2022. No, it's 2023. So um, keep looking at our website, www.alworth.org. Our next program will be Wednesday the 20th in the evening at 7 in this room, and we'll have a visitor from China who will talk about the new economic statecraft between the US, UK, and China. And then Thursday, the 21st at noon, the director of the library, Matt Rosendahl, and the bibliographer for the Sami collection, Chelsea Miller, who's here, the way of Chelsea, the bear surgeon, <laughs> um, went to the Arctic to work on weaving relationships through Sami's libraries, and they'll be talking about that on the 21st at noon, again in this room. So to start out today in recognition of the land that UMD sits on and because our guest also works with indigenous communities, I'd like to read UMD's land acknowledgement. We collectively acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Duluth is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the indigenous people. The university resides on the land that was cared for and called home by the Ojibwe people, before them the Dakota and Northern Cheyenne people, and other Native peoples from time immemorial. Ceded by the Ojibwe in an 1854 treaty, this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance for its original stewards, the Native nations and peoples of the region. We recognize and continually support and advocate for the sovereignty of the Native nations in this territory and beyond. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty and will work to hold the University of Minnesota Duluth accountable to American Indian peoples and nations. So today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Tero Mostenen um, speaking about his award-winning work, Transforming Depleted and Damaged Peatlands. The importance of this he will explain to you and make a Minnesota connection to. Dr. Mustanen is a Finnish founder and president of the Snow Change Cooperative, a nonprofit organization based in Finland with members across the Arctic, including many indigenous groups. He is an adjunct professor of geography at the University of Eastern Finland. He was awarded the 2023 Goldman Environmental Prize for his work restoring peatlands in Finland. He has also won several human rights and environmental awards for his work with snow change and the indigenous people of the Arctic. There is so much more I could say, I and mean, just amazing what he's accomplished. And he's young enough to be my son. You know, I would have been very young, but still, he's accomplished so much. So I encourage you to go to our website, www.alworth.org, to get a full, um, full listing of biographical information there. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mason. Thank you all, and thanks for coming at the start of the semester. Um, <coughs> so there's a really strong connection between Finland and this place. Um, let me join in also recognizing the tradi traditional owners and indigenous peoples of this place. I'm very thankful that we are on their land. And uh, we will be kicking off this about 20 minute presentation and then there you can ask questions, or if nobody has any questions, I'll be babbling on um, uh, with a small video. So we thought that this four-minute film would um, capture some of the context uh, quite well. It was done associated with the prize, and uh, it features a soundtrack by uh, Sigourney Weaver uh, from, from Aliens and all sorts of other um, minor films like The Avatar. So. Um, Let's watch that first and then I'll make some remarks and then we'll have a wonderful little chat if possible. So. Finland is a land of snow and ice and interconnected lakes, rivers and wetlands known as peatlands. These boggy expanses of partially decomposed plant matter 
have been slowly building since the end of the last ice age, and they cover some 30% of Finland's surface area. Peatlands are not always the sexiest to look at, but in fact they are amazing. Like the Amazon, they are one of our best aids in the fight against climate change. Tero Mustanen is a fisherman and a leader in his village of Selkie. He is also a co-founder of Snow Change Cooperative, a global network of local and indigenous communities working on climate change solutions. We discovered the immense capacity of peatlands to be able to restore our waters. They are keeping carbon on the ground and they are drawing down CO2 from the atmosphere in massive quantities. But after World War II, Finland began to industrialize, which meant cutting down its old growth forests for timber and draining its peatlands for peat mining. Peat is burned like coal for energy production. Now we have discovered that peat is more polluting than coal. It's not only the burning of the peat. When the peatlands are drained and no longer underwater, the peat disintegrates and releases all of its carbon directly to the atmosphere. The Linenso peatland near Taro's village of Selkie was drained and turned into a peat mine by the state energy company. I grew up seeing how peat mining destroyed our landscapes and all of this biodiversity were lost. In 2010 and again in 2011, Toxic runoff from the peat mining site caused a major fish die-off in the nearby waterways. The local people, many of them subsistence fishermen, were devastated. The pH level of the discharge was 2.77, which is comparable to battery acid. And that's why they killed all the fish and other life. I was the head of the community at that time. Here we were facing this pollution event under that river, we had a choice. Do we let it go or fight it? Fight is what Taro and his community did, ultimately forcing the energy company to close the site and provide initial financing to restore the peatland. And what we are seeing here is a transformation of a place where it was devoid of life, bursting back into life. In 2017, with the restoration of Linenso as inspiration, Taro and Snow Change launched a major rewilding program in Finland. By purchasing degraded peatlands, they could begin returning them to their wild state. We are seeing the largest rewilding and restoration campaign ever in Finnish history because of this place. Traditional knowledge guides a lot of the work that we do in restoration and rewilding. Traditional knowledge of the Finnish villages and indigenous knowledge of the Sami. Traditional knowledge is paired with the latest science and the restoration begins. The first step is to bring water back to the landscape. By raising the waters, there are immediate benefits. We are able to stop soil-based carbon release and emissions on day one. Since Snow Change's first land purchase, Taro has led the restoration of 70 peatlands throughout Finland, almost 130,000 acres. We have been able to demonstrate a big climate solution that will help the whole planet. And it has become a symbol for great hope for many people. I'm filled with reverence for how powerful the comeback can be if we are making it possible for nature to guide the work. For Outstanding Environmental Achievement for Europe, the 2023 Goldman Environmental Prize is awarded to Tero Mustanen, Selkie, Finland. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, that was a small four minutes of propaganda for what I will say to you. Um, and uh, 
Why did I uh, come here in Duluth in the first place is a story in itself. I'm kind of doing a 30-year tour today. Um, I landed here for the very first time in 1994. And I, I had been just accepted up in Ely uh, to the Scout Base International Guiding Program. And that's why um, some of you with, with some experience may remember people like Sherry Bridges or Sandy Bridges. We were known as the Charlie Guides. So there's a scout base for canoeing on Moose Lake up in Ely in the boundary waters. Um, and it had a very famous director called Sandy Bridges. And he was a missionary in the sense that he, he always felt that this place will benefit from a Nordic connection and international scouting and exchanges. And when you are 17, I was actually 17 when I applied and I don't know why Sandy accepted, but I had never been in an aeroplane. And I landed here and I was looking around like, what is this strange world of America where I have come to? And uh, there was no internet at that time, so all of you students out there tried to think about writing letters back home. It took 10 days for me to inform my family that I have landed safely. <laughs> and then another 10 days for the, the letter to tell me, okay, son, we are happy you landed safely. <laughs> so, uh, who could have believed now that we are here in the future? Uh, of course, I'm no longer 17 and uh, it's 30 kilos later. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, I made it. So this is kind of a wonderful 30 year anniversary engagement and also the scout base for the those of you who know Northern Tier or Charles L. Summers uh, Canoe Base, it just celebrated its 100th anniversary for operations. And unfortunately, Sandy passed away in 1997, but uh, Sherry is still here, and I'm very thankful to my so-called American mother who worked with this center to make, make you listen and, and suffer through my presentation for the next few minutes. So I'm here to try to talk about some of the work that uh, we do regarding climate change and maybe I can try to approach this in two levels. <clears throat> so I recently served in the IPCC. This is the United Nations Body on Climate Change Science called Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I was responsible for the Arctic uh, chapter as well as the European chapter and also coordinated a lot of the indigenous knowledge work in the panel. I'm a Finn myself, not Sami, but we work with the Sami and um, the linguistic connection between the Finnish or the Suomi people and the Sami people is a very distinct one. So Finns are not indigenous peoples, but as you saw in the video, a lot of our lifeways like the fishery or the hunting and others are very much moral. Uh, traditions and then we work closely with the indigenous Sami and I understood that uh, you had been over there uh, or our way uh, this summer so I'm happy that also the Sami, Sami connection exists here. Uh, and I'm flying here actually from Alaska so I was at the Bering Strait over the past three weeks for the work with Snow Change we were trying to document what's going on now with the devastating fires in Canada and how they are uh, affecting Alaska. I was in a place called Unalakleet. It's a very small Inupiaq village on the Bering Strait region. And one of the things we are uh, looking at is the uh, sinkholes and the melting permafrost and lack of sea ice um, and things like that with the old people and the elders. So I can answer on the Q&A if, if um, People want to hear about that side, and <clears throat> so on and so on. So, I guess there are two levels to the talk. The actual work that we do to try to restore the peatlands and then this international connection and, and uh, Snow Change, the organization that I work for, um, we were started 25 years ago, right coming off the guiding in Ely and then going back home and thinking when you are 24, and this was around 2000 or 1999, 2000. 
Things are so bad. Climate change is hitting us so hard. What can we do as young people? Uh, I was once young, no longer, but uh, anyways. And we were very hopeful that um, by the turn of the millennium, people will be sensible. They will be able to understand uh, how urgent things are 25 years ago. And uh, we, we set up to uh, document this Arctic in partnership and guided and consented by the indigenous peoples of the Arctic in Siberia, in Greenland, in Northern Canada, Alaska, and also with the Sami, uh, the impact of the early years of climate change on traditional communities, including the very first uh, melting of the permafrost, lack of sea ice, arrival of southern species like the salmon in the high arctic in North American North, this would have been around 2005, and so on and so on. So the first decade of the work that we were trying to do from the villages, Snow Change is kind of a network of villages and it has a research component, uh, took me to the US Senate. I spoke with your high officials and ambassadors and all sorts of uh, important people and at every time we tried to convey that, look, the Arctic will be the canary bird in the mind, so to speak, that you, you, you may be having a lot of good time right now, but uh, what's going on in the Arctic is going to be with you soon. And we are seeing warming and extreme weather events roughly at three to four times predicted for the rest of the planet. And the unfortunate fa fact with the Arctic connection or Boreal and the Arctic is that what's going on up there um, doesn't stay there. So both the Antarctic and the Arctic are kind of the cooling systems for the whole planet. This is all self-evident now, self now, but 20 years ago people were still like, yeah, maybe, maybe it's natural fluctuations or whatnot. And, uh, that's how we spent our first decade. And I have to say that a lot of good listening, a lot of good ears and yeah, fantastic work, really important and great. And even you, not only here, but also in Europe, even the best politicians were not able to accomplish a breakthrough that would have alleviated a lot of the things. And here we are in 2023. So then, uh, after doing this for a decade, even a dumb Finn like myself from the village started to understand that something else has to be going on. And as you saw in the, in the film, we started to realize that it's actually these habitats in Finland and ecosystems that have been created over the past uh, century. Now, don't get me wrong, many of you know Finland, Sweden and Norway, uh, as the leading Nordic countries, there is a strong social program. You can go to the, a place like this or an institution like this for free. Um, there are high taxes, but there are, there are also services that the society provides for you. Now, that came off the backs of our nature. Now we know that Finland was able to pay for this bill using those peatlands and forests. So sometimes pe people be, may be a little bit shocked when I say the numbers, but in Finland we lost 97% of our natural forests to logging in this time over the past 75 years. And as I said, there was benefits, but it was also a massive conversion of our nature. But first and foremost, we lost our peatlands. And after this decade of informing and trying to put forward research on how bad the northern climate change might be, we, we decided in 2012 in Snow Change that why don't we do something? Why don't we try to do, based on the evidence and knowledge we have, something that matters on the carbon and climate file? And that's why we launched our very first, you would call it ecosystem restoration site, this Linnusuo that you saw in the video, and it went from, it's about 400 acres, and when we started, it, was, it had been mined for about uh, 25 years. And it was a moonscape. It, there was nothing there. Maybe two bird species, and it was a massive source of carbon, especially CO2. Every second it was leaching to the atmosphere as a degraded peatland in the order of 1 million kilograms uh, a year 
CO2. So we started to realize that, and Linus saw this, this side that you saw in the film, is only one of thousands across Finland that were affected. So we started to calculate, and even us uh, from the villages could <laughs> add up saying, okay, here's a site, here's a site, here's a site. And if they are releasing every second this massive CO2 carbon dioxide input, what can we do to try to transform or take some meaningful action um, to um, look into that? And the context for that is that these peatlands, maybe I should have introduced myself as uh, Shrek from the swamp, that could have given a little bit more uh, um, clarity, but uh, these swamps, bogs, fens, peatlands, they are only 3% of world's geographical lands, but they contain up to one-third of the remaining soil-based carbon. Somebody, including myself, I stole it from a person, has called these the second lungs of the planet. People think about Amazonia and the rainforests, but the, the, these peatlands are very significant in when they are functioning, they can draw down CO2. Now they do breathe out methane, I can talk about that in the Q&A, but the, there's a dissipation point. So the benefits will outweigh the impact from another uh, greenhouse gas, the methane, if they are functioning and we can restore them. And uh, also this amount of post ice age carbon in the soil can and has to stay there. We can't afford, especially now, any more um, have any more releases. So we embarked on this uh, pilot site, Linnusua, 400 acres. It went in terms of biodiversity. We are tracking the birds, for example, from two bird species to 215 bird species in two years. In terms of climate, we were able to stop all the so uh, site-specific carbon dioxide emissions through that rewetting. So you may have seen the drone footage where we rose the waters and that, that of course restarts the um, peatland function. And then in terms of water quality, that river that was affected by the pollution from the peat mine used to be a trout river, brook trout, trout, trout. And you could go there and they would be jumping there and happily living their lives and being kind of a cultural indicator species and all of them died. So then now, 10 years after, the trout are back and they are spawning on the river and it's all fine and dandy. And by looking at these indicators from this very first site on that 400 acres, we started to realize, much like here in Minnesota, that these northern peatlands <coughs> on the boreal and temperate forests contain not all of the solution, but a massive solution uh, in scale that we have to act on. So please remember, this is coming after the decade of meeting with a lot of politicians, with the high, high people and the VIPs and rock stars and whatnot, and everybody's saying, yeah, it's so important, it's yeah, fantastic work, and, but yeah, we can do much change right now. So that's why we started to uh, enable this, um, what we call landscape rewilding program. Based on the success of, of this pilot site and some of the other uh, scientifically sound uh, actions. And as you saw in the film, I'll try to give you here at the conclusion some of the context for Finland. So uh, you saw that Finland came after war. We lost to the Soviet Union. We had to pay a lot of war reparations to Moscow. Um, how funny is that in this horrible time right now? But anyways, and this kind of uh, created the context of very heavy-handed uh, decision-making in Finland, where the villages or the Sami, as indigenous peoples, don't have any land rights. So I was leading my village also in a time when those mining or other extractive decisions were made without us having any say or any buffer or or rights to, to uh, consult or, or uh, inform the use of natural resources. So now, by 2017, that's when we launched the Landscape Rewilding Program. 
we knew that this might be very big. We had a couple of big, good starting uh, funders, the European Investment Bank and Rewilding Europe Foundation. It's a foundation in the Netherlands. But we knew that we have to come to the table and, and do this in a way that's completely new. It can't replicate nature conservation or use of natural resources of the past hundred years because I think it's Gandhi and many other leaders who have said that you can't fix the problem with the same tools that created that problem. And that's why we wanted to uh, embrace uh, very strongly latest science. We know that you have here one of the leading world's leading programs, the Spruce program, that's looking at exactly the same issue. So we had a lot of scientists like myself and also the old people. So the fishermen, the indigenous Sami, the herder, Osmo Seuroyarvi, who you saw there, and Paulina Fedorov and many others. And uh, we also wanted this to be mattering to the community. So every action we do on a peatland or a forest, river, doesn't matter what, has to create local employment. It has to respond in an orderly fashion to women's rights and employment. It has to be safe. It has to be supportive of staying in the villages so that there is not the continuous outflow into Helsinki, out migration that's very visible, of course, today. And here we are seven years later, and now it's up to 80 sites across Finland, including about 15 indigenous Sami sites, and then about 65 Finnish village sites. And if you want the numbers, we are um, probably now in your acres, approaching 180,000 acres of restored habitat and we are the biggest um, program in Finland on private lands. Of course the state of Finland has the possibility to decide on restoration on, on state and federal lands as, as you would call it. But we are the only one out there that's implementing full rights of the Sami, inclusion of indigenous knowledge, Many people sometimes ask me, how, how, what, what does it mean in practice? I can talk more about that in the Q&A, but I'll just say that many of the old people in the villages and the Sami remember. So there's a knowledge of how things used to be before the destruction happened or the degradation of an ecosystem. So it's about memory, it's about special relationship with nature. We know here, for example, that the Anishinaabe people, when they came here in, in uh, and after their vision for the food that grows on water, which is of course the wild, wild rice, um, they made sure very early on that that rice and the waters are protected um, to the extent they could when things started to change. So that's kind of the context of what I wanted to open up with today, where uh, working with these national governments, the Big Science, Arctic Council, um, was of course very informative. But to summarize it, the scientists were telling us, yeah, we need more research. Mm. It's very urgent, but we need more research. Mm. And the politicians said, fantastic, but you know, I'm on a two year or a four year election cycle and it's so important, but I can't, I can't. And uh, we thought, well, when can we, if not now? And that's why we then decided to say that I'm not going to use a bad word, but let's let's uh, let's <laughs> go our own way and do it by ourselves if we have the science and the knowledge. And uh, I don't know where this will end. If you come back for my sixtieth tour in Duluth, maybe I'll tell you that that was the moment when it kind kind of went down. But I want to end by saying that the coming, I mean, I served in IPCC, which is the most powerful scientific climate institution in the world, as a lead author. Uh, you can blame me for a lot of the mistakes there if you want. Um, but even there, the actual change, the physical transformation fast that we have to do, and in new ways, is not going to be happening. And that's why. I want to end with a notion that um, we need peace with the land. The war has to end. The endless barrage of damages, the exploitation, and so on and so on, no matter who we are, doesn't matter anymore. 
The only way forward is to come to a peace both within ourselves and our mind and also with the land. Thank you. And also, I want to add that Minnesota is the only state, in addition to uh, Alaska, that has a large portion of peatlands. You will have different names for them, but they are the bulky expanses, like Zach's Zim, just uh, northwest of here. And uh, uh, you have a lot of potential here. And I'm very happy to talk about how, how the actual technical side goes, but uh, I wanted to try to give you the context. So. You can also ask about Minnesota. Yes, please. Yeah. Can people hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much. That was that was excellent. Thank you for the, the work that you do, um, which is just extraordinary. Um, I did want to ask uh, about a Minnesota issue that connected to the work you're doing, which is um, the tension, at least in Minnesota, and you can tell me whether this was the case in, in Finland as well, that exists between those who are concerned about climate issues and want to protect or restore the land, and those whose employment um, derives from the extraction of resources on those lands. So, you know, in the Finnish case, uh, I imagine the, the peat mining industry, there may have been local workers who were potentially upset with uh, you know, the work that you and, and others were trying to do. And I, I'm just hoping, because that is such a big issue here in, in Minnesota, if you could say something about that tension and how you <coughs> negotiated that, that tension, overcame it to be able to succeed in, in your work. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And uh, I think the environmental movement makes also mistakes. They don't want to talk about it, but they often don't understand that in order to um, govern, in addition to raising critical issues, is a long haul and it's a mar marathon. So by raising a lot of uh, issues like the climate or the biodiversity or whatnot, uh, that's extremely valuable work, but it doesn't respond to your question. How do the people and the economy function in, in that new future that wants to happen, that may happen. And uh, the, the uh, program that we are trying to put in place is all about governance. So one of the things I didn't tell you is that we are actually buying also lots of land, as well as operating on land concessions. So in order to get to that almost 200,000 acres, we have had to sometimes physically buy land, it's not a great thing to do, I, I will tell you. But that's sometimes the only way, excuse me, to uh, make sure that we have a good start. And then come the critics. Are you only going to be preserving it or will it not function or produce? Or how does, the, how does forestry, for example, look like in the future? We have tried to hire in every village and every place, sometimes the same operators on diggers and tractors and and uh, so on and so on uh, that opened up those pit mines. And there's a number of... Uh, so one of the things we have been trying to put forward is, at least on the short term, um, direct financial benefits into those remote villages in Finland where in some ways the digger doesn't care what he's doing and in this case, they become our heroes because they know the land and they sometimes even opened up those pit mines in the 1970s. And now we have Jari Perala, for example, who is putting them uh, or restoring the same site where he worked in 1973, uh, as long as the, the um, financial incentive and employment is there. So the program has been a very powerful way of bringing uh, jobs on the short term to the villages and also in those sectors that are not usually touched by the en environmental movement, which is the operators and so on and so on. The other side of the coin is that we have also tried to think what are the ways to bring uh, jobs and, as I said, security and 
uh, female jobs and so on and so on to make sure that the gender rights are also respected. Uh, and we have a program on River Guardians and some of these sites as ranger programs. So we know that there is a lot of interest now in the north. Think about Ely and how many people are going through the outfitters every year, especially after COVID, I was told. So the future may be partly actually, at least in, in the service sector. And by restoring these habitats and by narrating in a good and concise and meaningful way the story, the comeback, the biodiversity, birds, for example, we are able to create jobs that are long term. So what I'm trying to say is that the program that we have is trying to answer in an orderly fashion to the short term jobs and asking the guys with the diggers and the knowledge to come and help because we are discussing landscape level restoration. Sometimes you can have five miles across a peatland and all of that has to be restored. So that's one. And secondly, on the long term, on the long haul, we need rangers, we need guides, we need outfitters, river guardians who are able to service and share this place for the people that are coming. And then, uh, of course, thirdly, nature has its inherent value. So there are, uh, there is always uh, value in doing this restoration for the climate benefit and biodiversity and the waters. Uh, you will never take away the, all of the conflict or, or kind of um, tensions, as you put it, in the village. There are always people and they should have their opinions. But that's why we are village-led. I, I, I use the term village because that's the concept back home, but you talk about communities here probably. Uh, and we try to operate on consensus that we don't, we don't say to anybody, you are wrong. These may be very justified opinions if somebody has been in the forestry business for 60 years and somebody comes and says, now we need this area to do better in, in the near future where we are. But on the other hand, um, we can't stray away from the facts like this summer, for example, we have seen the fires, we have seen Hawaii on what's going on there. I was listening to the public radio in, in Louisiana this week, record drought. And I guess the difference between very confrontational organizations and our work is that we try to listen and um, in, instead of division, we try to find that peace that I was talking about. We all have to live here and there is some forestry that will happen in the future. So some of the environmentalists will want to conserve everything. That will not happen in places like Finland. So we have to just do it smarter, we have to save biodiverse forests, restore peatlands and so on, but it's, it's not no longer one or the other, it's a chess game and you move different pieces and then you listen and drink lots of coffee with <laughs> hundreds of people and I have found out to conclude, I, I, my wife says I ramble too much so I'll end here, but um, I'll, I'll just say that even the hardest critics, the, the man who owns the forest or woman who's really angry about all the environmentalists and so on, once you actually sit down with them on their terms and you discuss, you present what you do, let's modify our plan based on your wishes and let's work together. Why not? It could be fun and if it doesn't work out, we'll take all the responsibility. 99% um, have said yes. So actually, the grievance, in my mind, in Finland, I don't want to talk about this country because I don't know about your case, but it's created. Most of those talks, one-on-one, -on -one, and having that cup of coffee or tea will solve. Enough that we come to a place where we talk to each other, we listen, and then decide. And that's a powerful force. But for some reason, we are living in a time and this wasn't the case when I was here in 1994. This was kind of the beacon uh, for us um, that it's very angry. But I'm not 100% convinced that anger is genuine. It's also propagated by many people and in Finland. And this division is being fueled by all sorts of forces. And I don't have any political affiliation. I live in a small village. 
and I fish commercially, so I could be any way up, down, left or right, doesn't matter, even in the center. And uh, I just find it very sad that we can't reach out and listen to each other who we are and uh, respect that. We don't have to get, uh, agree on all points, but what we are 110% certain of is that there will, won't be a village if we don't start to work together uh, because of these drivers that are in place. Thank you for a very good question. Please. Other questions? Other questions? I'll, I'll promise to be more concise, but this was a big issue. Is that um, is there any concern that the ascension to NATO and the conflict, of course, in Ukraine will result in a militarization of any of these areas? Very good question. Uh, not all of you may have known, but Finland joined NATO, um, and before the Russo-Ukrainian war of February 2022, let's say 23rd of February, I was, a, I was against NATO. The poll, polling was around 18% for NATO and 82 against it. And on the 24th of February, it was like 89% favor and 11 against. And many of you know Finland and our history with the Winter War, so you know that what happened in that February last year happened to us in 1939. Soviets invaded without provocation. And we had a war, and we lost one third of Finland to the Russians, and I had two grandfathers in that war. And I have lived in Russia for 20 years for the work uh, on and off, in Siberia for the climate work, and I know the Russian country, or the whole federation quite well. I love the people, but what, what a horrible thing that happened. Let's not go into further into that. But the the new future that we have embarked with you, the US, and thank you for accepting us in NATO, I have to say now, uh, has and will bring a lot of land use changes. And we are right at the Russian border, and we do know that the um, uh, new, I wouldn't say new bases will come, but certainly there will be radar stations, there will be more uh, flights by your. F-22s or whatnot, F-18s, and uh, it's it's more tense. So I live in a, in the bush, but now I see NATO planes going in the night night sky, and they practice a lot, and they use the uh, flares, and it's very different than it was before the war. And nobody knows. I mean, precaution died on Thursday, and um, it, it's a very volatile time. So. But I also want to express here publicly the, the uh, inner sentence thanks to, uh, to the support for Ukraine because nobody wants war. I understand people, not all of the people want to uh, support the US support in military terms, but I have to say that there wouldn't be Ukraine if, if you didn't give your aid. I'm, my, one of my best friends is the head of the Ukrainian uh, association in Finland. They help the refugees when they come from the front they distribute them in, in uh, new houses and they guide what Finland is all about. And Arseni um, uh, has informed that uh, without the US aid, there wouldn't be Ukraine. And soon there would have not been Finland, I'm pretty sure, if things went really bad. So, so it, US has stepped up a lot. Not everything great from here, but on that side, uh, we thank you. Hi, could you talk a little bit more about the stewardship of the lands that you've restored? I know some of them you said were purchased outright and some are acquired by different means. I'm a little curious how it's uh, stewarded both locally and if you have a national program as well. Thank you. So all, every single piece of land we have as land concession or purchased land will be um, protected immediately, and we call them community conserved areas. It's a concept under the UN uh, Biodiversity Convention, where essentially it says that there are people and there's nature, and those people, we trust the people to be good stewards of the land. So Snow Change acts kind of like a land trust, but it's the villages that then 
work with us to create something called co-management. I don't know if any of the students are studying things in the Arctic or around the world, but for example, your Grand Portage, the, the uh, national monument here, just north of here, uh, is co-managed between the um, federal agency and the local tribe. And that, that's an example that would be comparable on how we manage or as steward, as you would say, our lands uh, in the Finnish case. So all of our lands are then uh, jointly managed by representatives from the local hunters, from the local village, from the women's organization, the nature authority, and so on and so on, and us. And we call it co-management so that it will never compromise the biodiversity, but we can, for example, enable some iconic hunting like the moose, or we are working with the hunters to control invasive species like mink, raccoon dog, and others, and have a ranger program, for example, and monitoring, community-based monitoring using traditional knowledge, citizen science, and the schools may, may be involved. I'll just add that for the case of the uh, Sami forests, um, these are indigenous tribal lands, and um, sometimes the purchase of those lands, mostly forests, has been the only mechanism to prevent clear cuts on post Ice Age primary forest. And then, if we buy Sami land, I actually published on this at University of Minnesota book series, so I can send the chapter to anybody who is interested. It's not great, it's not happily done to buy indigenous land. It's a big uh, decision, but it's the, sometimes the only decision because there are no land rights in Finland. In those cases where we purchase, as a Finnish organization, Sami land, we hand over the management rights to the Sami for reindeer herding, handicrafts, berry picking, hunting, or whatnot, whatever the sacred places. There are still some sacred places on our sites. And, and we stay off, or we just make sure that things are done so that no logging happens there, but uh, and en enable some of the scientific monitoring. But in those cases, on tribal lands, it's the Sami uh, radio herders and, and the women. Actually, most of our um, Sami sites are managed by Sami women. So that's how we enable it. Please. <coughs> Hello. Hello. You mentioned the carbon dioxide and the methane mm -hmm. and how the peat handles it and said you'd expand on it if anybody wanted it. So could I hear some more about that? Yeah, so this will be a seven hour lecture. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the uh, one minute version. Um, let's go back quickly to the numbers. So. Out of everything we have left in 2023, one third, it's estimated that one third of the world's remaining uh, soil based carbon is in the peatlands. And most of those peatlands are in the Boreal here in Minnesota. You have hundreds of thousands of acres that you could work on to do this. Uh, but most of them are in Canada, Alaska, and Finland, those, and Russia. Those are the big, big four. And uh, when the peatland functions as it's supposed to be under normal conditions, it's like the lungs. It's drawing in CO2, and that's the good stuff. And unlike the Amazonia, it's breathing out methane, which is a potent, another greenhouse gas, but it's a natural exchange. We can't do anything about it. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, but it's part of the natural carbon cycle. And the good news is that there's a dissipation point. So, for example, on restored uh, peatland, the methane that will be starting to be released um, is, or the benefits will outweigh, uh, the CO2 benefits will outweigh the methane harm in about 10 to 15, perhaps 20 years, depending on the peatland. So what we are doing in the peatland, peatland restoration is that uh, let's first look at the damage. They have been mines or drained. You have had, I heard, 22,000 miles of ditches here in Minnesota on peatlands and uh, probably more. Um, 
So what does the actual restoration do? It raises the water table, okay? And there's a fantastic moss called Spangnum. It's the workhorse of the Arctic. This used to be a Will Stegger's statement on, on the Twin Otter plane, but let's use it here for argument's sake. So there is a moss that will start to proliferate fast on a restored peatland. It's vegetation based, of course, and it will, as it does that, and the functionality of a peatland when the waters are up uh, uh, continues, the drawdown of CO2 will resume. People are very anxious about the uh, carbon, but I will also say that every single peatland is a massive biodiversity hotspot. And thirdly, for every dollar that you are uh, investing in restoration, it's also helping your St. Louis River. So you have a lot of peatland in the St. Louis uh, catchment or basin. Some of it is degraded, others are preserved, and uh, your water quality on the river and ultimately in the Lake Superior is being affected by the fact that these peatlands are still functioning. So that's that's a one minute fifteen version. <laughs> well thank you and I'll I'll stand up and face people. I, I think this was an awesome presentation, Dr. Mustaman. So thank you. Thank you. I looked into this a little bit this morning before I came, and my wife Lucy will tell you that I rattled too. But for those that don't know, we have an incredible project in northern Minnesota called the Spruce Project. Anybody here been to it? Yeah. And it's $50 million sunk into a peatland in the middle of nowhere. It's incredible. You can and send it to us too. Pardon me? You can send it to us too if you have $50 million. <laughs> Yeah, I know. So for those that want to know more about it, there was a half hour special created on public television out of Lakeland, Minnesota, Lakeland Public Television. And it's called the Spruce Project. I check it out. It's, it's a very good uh, program. And the reason I was referring to that was that um, I know that there was legislation this year introduced in the state legislature to try to help protect our peatlands. It made it through the House. It didn't get into this or it didn't get through the Senate. And I don't know why it didn't get through the Senate, but I would just encourage people to contact the legislators and talk to them about it if you have concerns, because I do think that it is a viable issue. And for all the reasons that you spoke about, this is something that we can do locally to try to change the future, maybe not on a scale like you are, but hopefully um, to do something useful. Um, I can just read to you that Sierra Club proposed a lowland carbon and habitat reserve which would protect habitat and keep carbon sequestered in high priority state owned lowland conifer forests and peatlands, ecosystems which are rare across the world. And um, they, did, they did not get it to pass through the conference committee, but they did get $500,000 for a study on the benefits of protecting these lands, which will be conducted by the University of Minnesota. So um, uh, that is that. And I, I'll finish by asking, the economics are always the important or the, the, the underlying uh, most difficult part of this. And I was curious if you found a way to monetize the carbon sequestration of your peatlands to help drive the effort forward. So thank you for letting me share that. Well, thank, thank you for a very timely conversation. And let me start by saying that uh, if, if Minnesota doesn't get it right, what other state will? Yeah. So this is the hum homework for you that I want to leave you with, that um, it's bad out there and we had those fires, but you have been always very sensible state and people. Um, and why don't I ask you to solve it? So you are here in the U.S. and you have a voice and that's a really good example of the Spruce study and your own uh, state actions and, and all the things to come. So I sometimes, when people talk about the U.S. back home, I try to say that I went to Minnesota and that was the most sensible place I have ever, ever been in North America. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good little, little challenge for you. 
But uh, in order to talk about the carbon sequestration and financing, um, maybe five to seven years ago, there was a lot of early promise with carbon credits. So there was a notion that it can be a market driven and there are some, some credits that have functioned. Um, so the idea is that if you are naughty, if you are polluting as a business, you might be able to buy credits to alleviate some of the trouble in good projects that are certified. On peatlands, the problem is certification. We have found out that the per acre, uh, let's call it yield, or the CO2 benefit, requires substantial monitoring. And it's really, really hard on boreal peatlands. I'm not talking about all, world of, all of world's peatlands, but here, on temperate and, and uh, boreal peatlands, the vegetation may be very diverse and it is, if you want to be honest, and we here in Minnesota want to be very honest, of course, uh, it's very hard to certify in scale. So then um, we have seen that the carbon credit market is not really moving and I have real doubts that it will not move. So that's why the financial yield, probably I would put a lot of my eggs into the like we are financed all by charities and donor organizations because we as an organization have this ethic for the indigenous communities and having inherent value in nature so we don't have to make money out of it even though we of course create employment opportunities as we go along. I would just say that tourism is one of the big things. Uh, maybe we could calculate the water quality, that's one aspect how much purification of water happens in a peatland, that's something we could quantify as a benefit and it would have value as opposed to using that land for economic services. And gently we may, might outline something on the carbon file, but I don't want to say uh, it, it's a big win. Mm -hmm. And I would like to think that um, in some ways this is also financially a responsibility to the government because they have enabled those lands to be utilized for certain purposes and benefits in the past and now we know based on these studies and, and whatnot that this is a big solution. So in some ways the public money might be playing a role and it doesn't always have to be all private money that solves the case. The difficulty or the nexus that you have to solve here and I'll ask you to do this is that um, on county lands, the county, for example St. Louis, will be ex expecting a financial yield from the lands they own, and they own a large portion of peatlands uh, around the river and the whole basin, all the way to Hibbing, where a certain musician was born and something. Uh, so, change that. Can you go to the county and, and the, the politicians here and argue that, look, it's not going to be always financial yield, it can be these benefit yields from these peatlands and if the county can change their mandate on those peatlands that they own, my god, that's a big window for you. Because that, that would enable um, a lot of sequestration, a lot of water quality, biodiversity, well-meant tourism and other non-harmful uses of the land to start to further generate incomes in the villages and in the area. And I would go maybe quickly down that pathway where the action on the county lands is, could unlock a lot of potential for